What is going on everyone? In this video, I'm going to show you how this app is made using AWS. So this application is called Crowdfree and it's built by TripAdvisor. And the whole purpose of this application is to answer the question, when and where are certain locations busy? Especially currently where everyone's trying to stay a little bit further away from everyone and being a little bit more socially distant. This is a very important question that a lot of us have. Is the beach going to be a little bit too busy today? Is the supermarket too busy at 6 p.m.? Should I go a little bit later? This is important information and there's a whole application architecture that is built on AWS that helps you answer this question. So just taking a quicker look at what's happening in this application, um, we have some different types of data. So polygon data very clearly. Um, and if we click on each of these, these are all distinct locations. So we have Sunglass Hut over here and we have a kind of a timeline of when this location is particularly busy. I don't know who goes to Sunglass Hut at 10 or 11 p.m., but that's a different question. Uh, however, they also have some other information, which is this kind of rasterized imagery here. And this is created using uh, anonymized geolocation data that's gathered from folks' cell phones. So this looks like it's probably a park or something because we have all this congregation here. But this video is gonna be how this application is made. It's done so completely on AWS in combination with some other interesting data sources. So let's head over to the architecture diagram and start taking a look. All right, guys, so here we are looking at the architecture diagram for this application. Uh, and we can see just taking a look at the top, reading the description that TripAdvisor built a social distancing application called Crowdfree that enables users to see people's presence in stores and public spaces. The app leverages serverless architecture, purpose-built databases, and data lakes. So just taking a look, uh, I kind of labeled this for you a little bit here. So this whole top section here is all the front end app. It's also the most kind of non-interesting part of this architecture. So I want to spend most of my time at the bottom here talking about the back end. Uh, that's the bottom half of this diagram here. So how does this whole thing fit together? So we can see here right at the center, we have something that is connected to a lot of other things. And this is usually like danger zone for me. If all this stuff is flowing in and out, um, I like to start asking asking questions right away about what this component is doing. Now it turns out what this component is doing is using what's called Apache Airflow. And Apache Airflow is kind of like a workflow orchestration system that allows you to kind of schedule jobs and say, after this is done, then do this thing, then do this thing, yada, yada, yada. So it's very, very useful from a data processing perspective. And that's how they're leveraging it in this application. An equivalent on AWS would be something like um, AWS Step Functions or SWF, which stands for Simple Workflow Service. Those are also very common commonly used for these types of problems, but uh, for whatever reason, they decided to go with Apache Airflow and that is hosted using EC2, however, so it is on the cloud. So in terms of the data, we saw during that demonstration that they have kind of road data, they have polygon data of these locations. They obviously have location information of us, like everybody, and where they are and when. Uh, so let's go through some of the different data sources. Uh, so over here in the bottom right here, we have some mention of open street maps. So that's how they are getting that road information, which is a useful input to provide context as to why people are in certain locations. Uh, we see here that is fed in to a Postgres database on AWS using Aurora. For whatever reason, they have some kind of daisy chaining. So that also goes into another database. They don't really mention why they do this. However, um, you know, I'm sure they have a good reason. Um, they did mention that they use purpose-built databases. So maybe they're, they're extracting some data from it and storing it elsewhere. And then they are also using uh, POI, which also stands for point of interest data from SafeGraph. And SafeGraph has a uh, polygon data for these points of interest. So where, you know, banks, shopping malls, uh, retail locations, maybe even like apartment complexes, all that kind of information. So I did draw a brief little diagram here to show like how this data is connected because I want to walk you through it. Uh, so actually before we go into that, so we know that that data is stored into S3 and then somehow it gets over here into their RDS. They, they kind of gloss over the details on this point, but that's where that data lands. Okay, so let's go into like what this POI and uh, OpenStreetMap data looks like. So I drew this little diagram down here just to kind of explain this to you a little bit. So this is kind of what uh, OpenStreetMap or OSM data would look like. You have um, junctions or nodes that represent intersections and then assuming all of these other four are intersections, you'd also have a node there and then you'd have edges. So like this is an edge 
and maybe there's like a certain speed limit here. Maybe it's like 60 miles an hour. So this is kind of what the, the data looks like. It's very spatial in nature. Uh, it's highly interconnected and uh, provides a lot of context for why people are in certain locations. They also give you more information, like if it's a primary or tertiary road, but that doesn't really matter for this application. So point of interest information does matter quite a bit for this application. I attempted to draw it out for you here. Let me actually get a different color too. Okay, so what I was trying to demonstrate here is that point of, inf point of interest information are these kind of spatial polygons, right? So um, maybe in this top section here, this is a kind of strip mall, you know, it's got a whole bunch of shops in it. And each of these little shops here, they're all independent shops. Uh, so one, two, three, four, five, six shops here. And um, you get the polygon information of each of these shops. So these are all POIs. Okay, so they get all this data from SafeGraph and the question is like, how do they derive any meaning from it? So the next step uh, of what they do in terms of a grouping mechanism, because at the end of the day, they do want to group by these spatial locations, but it's not very useful to use these locations themselves because they're very like oblong shapes. And so what they decided to use what are called H3 hexagons. And I just want to bring you over to the website really quick. Uh, H3 is a hexagonal hierarchical spatial index and it's built by Uber. And uh, essentially it allows you to specify some locations and drape a hexagonal tessellation on top of the Earth's surface. So you have these larger hexagons that you can see here, and then within them, you break that down to smaller hexagons. What that does is help eliminate some of the noise of those oblong shapes for particular locations and kind of smooth it out a little bit. Uh, and it turns out hexagons are a really useful shape in doing that. Also gives you that these interesting uh, parent-child relationships. So like this tiny hexagon here is a child of this bigger hexagon here. So you can do some interesting groupings a little bit later on once you process your data. So just to give you a quick little demonstration, here's what another one looks like. Um, so here they have some kind of spatial information, which is pretty similar to what we're going to have for, you know, people, people are located in places like this Then they overlay some, uh, hexagons on top of it. And then they do groupings. So we can see here, this hexagon obviously has the most number of people. And on a core pleth map, this would indicate the highest concentration also lets you do some neat little gradients here. So when you, uh, group things and put them all into certain ranges in the same color, you get these very interesting color um, representations that tend to illuminate some interesting patterns. So that's what they're doing in the next step. They are using this information to drape hexagons on top of essentially the world. So if we zoom in a little bit here, um, this is what they're doing. So they are draping these hexagons on top and each of these hexagons has a particular ID. And now they're putting it on top of these strip malls and saying, okay, this particular hexagon, it intersects two different strip malls. So its count is two. It intersects, you know, this one and it intersects this strip mall, right? Whereas one that this one, for example, only intersects one, which is this kind of uh, colored area that I just filled in. So that's what they're doing. They're draping these hexagons on top here. And it turns out that this is a very common pattern. The other data that they use, which is that anonymized geolocation data is also going to be, um, placed under these hexagons and the same kind of grouping is going to happen. So they're going to be able to derive some very interesting insight by using this grouping mechanism and ensuring that, you know, they're, they're factoring in these oblong shapes that tend to add noise to the calculations. So let's uh, zoom back out there because I want to show you uh, where this particularly happens. So uh, they have this information that comes in from safe, safe graph and then the Apache workflow or sorry, the Apache airflow application is orchestrating a job that is run by these EMR machines, which stands for elastic, I believe MapReduce, if I'm not mistaken, essentially uh, big data processing using um, dedicated hardware. So they spawn up some EMR machines and then they try to figure out for every single a hexagon that exists, what are the number of points of interest that are located inside each individual one? So at the end, you get this very interesting tessellation that looks very similar to kind of what I just showed you right here. Very, very similar. Okay, so that's that step. Uh, what is the next one? So the next one is to ingest data from Veriset and X mode. Now, this is more towards the uh, geolocation data. So if you imagine what kind of data these 
things have. Let's actually go back to this example here. And I'm going to get rid of these hexagons because it just confuses everybody and zoom in a little bit. Yeah, that's too much. Yeah, that's good. Okay. So if you imagine like we have a timeline, right? Oh, that's a terrible different color as well. There we go. So that's a timeline. So, and this is uh, 1 p.m., 2 p.m., 3 p.m., 4 p.m., 5 p.m., right? So for this particular location, and remember we had hexagons over here, in this particular location, maybe at 1 p.m., like you have three people in here, right? And then, so we would have put, put three for this particular hexagon up here. And then, you know, at 2 p.m., it may be only one. So three and one, right? And then... I keep on undoing this, but you, you get the idea. This changes over time. So for every particular hexagon that exists, they're doing this grouping mechanism to say at this moment in time, and it's probably even more granular. It's probably by the minute. Uh, but I think actually, if I remember the application, it was only by the hour. But essentially, they're building this timeline across each of these hexagons to say, you know, this particular location at 4 p.m., there are on average, you know, three people there. So that's how that insight is built into that map through that layer. Now, how it actually turns into a map layer, that's a different story. And that's actually the next thing that I want to talk about. So let me get rid of this because we're going to come back here. I don't want it to confuse anyone. Uh, OK, so that's good. Now. Let's go back up here to talk about the next step. So after all that information from the telemetry data is indexed by the EMR uh, cluster, that gets stored into S3. And S3, uh, like I'm sure many of you know, is just a raw data store, very, very useful for storing large objects, small objects, medium size of any type, essentially. And what they need to do now, like they have all the information that's stored raw in S3 or a combination of S3 and Postgres actually. And what they need to do is boil that information down into geolocation data. And there's a special data format called GeoJSON. And that is what is backing that map layer that we were seeing over on this step here. Like the way that this is created is through a layer that consists of, of GeoJSON that has all this spatial description information located or embedded in it rather. Uh, so that's how that's created. Now how that actually gets in is what we're about to talk about now. So we have all this raw data sitting in S3 and then we need to convert it to GeoJSON. So we have a job that runs in Amazon Athena and Amazon Athena is great for big data crunching, very similar to what we saw in EMR. However, it's completely serverless and there's no infrastructure for you to manage. On top of that, it's on a pay for what you use model and you can read all of that data directly out of S3. So instead of like loading that data for First into you know Postgres over here and then you know having some lambda function that like reads into that and doing some crazy nonsense basically you just have your raw data sitting in S3 itself and then Athena by default will just read into it and do some processing based on the query that you write so that is exactly what happens it does that kind of hexagon uh, intersection with all that point of interest information and all that uh, telemetry data to output a new layer and that layer goes back into S3. So now that GeoJSON layer, or Geo, it's not a layer yet actually, it's just GeoJSON information is loaded into S3. Now the next step is getting it into a format that is servable on a web browser. And for that we need, uh, well what they use is a Mapbox layer. Now Mapbox is a technology that allows you to create your own layers that's used on things like you know Google Maps, Yahoo Maps, Bing Maps, all that kind of stuff. And allows you to define your own color and style. You can embed your own data onto it using um, GeoJSON and uh, creating a layer out of your GeoJSON data. And that's exactly what they do here. So they have another step that will read off of the data, the process data that's in S3, and then take that information and just scrolling to the right here and then putting that in Mapbox. So at this point, everything is processed. We went through the entire processing and now this layer is sitting over here in Mapbox. So if you go to the right URL that contains the Mapbox layer uh, or add it through your own code, you'd be able to see essentially what we saw in the initial demonstration. Now there, that, that's kind of how that layer gets generated. And just going back to crowd free, there is some extra stuff that isn't included for this layer. For example, like this search bar up here and like some of this stuff is like data, like live data that they get and you can like change the day and everything. I don't know what this button does, but I'm sure there's more functionality here where they actually need APIs. 
And that's what the front end section is for. So I want to kind of talk about that really quick. So they are using AWS Amplify, which helps you get set up very quickly um, on AWS, allows you to use uh, do things like uh, user authentication, authorization, uh, allows you to add new APIs very, very quickly and add data stores very, very quickly. So they're using AWS Amplify, which is a cool thing to see. Also using a web application firewall, which is a great tool to use if you're concerned with DDoS attacks or distributed denial of service attacks. It helps mitigate those. And it's a good thing to put in front of your application, especially if it's one that's gonna be serving a lot of traffic. From there, we have a API that is backed by Amazon Gateway. That talks to a Lambda function, uh, which talks to Elasticsearch service. And Elasticsearch service is what powers that um, location search that we saw just a moment ago in the top section there. And we also have some other APIs that are integrated with uh, DynamoDB, probably for just um, like snapshot information for particular uh, sections of the application, but they don't really talk about uh, what, what they are doing here and why. So that is pretty much it for this application. I think we walked through it all. I hope you really enjoyed this video. You should watch my other one on gaming architectures. I'll put the playlist on the right-hand side here. And if you enjoyed, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks so much, and I'll see you next time.